So, yeah, let's just talk about this clip here. So, this is courtesy of the Bill and Burt podcast. Of course, I think most of you are familiar with these two individuals. Bill Burr, probably one of the best stand-up comedians now in the world, I'd imagine. Maybe him and Dave Chappelle are one and two. My favourites are probably him, Dave Chappelle, Sebastian Manasako, and Norm MacDonald. They're probably my top four and maybe i'd say five that will sneak in there will be like a, a mark norman right they're probably my favorites out there at the moment but bill and burt kreischer who's another stand-up comedian have this really great podcast where the whole dynamic of it is really good because you wouldn't really expect them to be friends right bill's kind of a feisty prickly guy who kind of is never happy about anything and burt is basically a lucky go a happy go lucky um functionally functional alcoholic uh bro dad who kind of you know is known for doing some really great marketing skits and whatever it may be but in recent years i've kind of felt as if like bert started to get a little bit annoying right he started to become a little bit annoying the laughs are getting a little bit over excessive his kind of you know disbelief at how anybody can lose weight gets annoying justificating justificating justifying his alcohol consumption gets a little bit tedious um you know putting all like family business out there in order for laughs and giggles on the stage it just kind of rubs me up the wrong way a little bit right so that's why i purposely stop listening to his podcast you know you kind of have to take him in small doses which are why which is why I find him better to enjoy on the Bill and Burt podcast and also the Two Bears, One Cave. I feel like those two people, Tom Tegro and Bill Burr, are great balances and great kind of um, uh, little buffers in order for these like kind of manic episodes. But um, part of the reason why I've kind of been, again, put off by him a little bit as well was kind of his response to the whole Chris D'Elia stuff. So Chris D'Elia, another stand-up comedian within the LA comedy scene, as you guys know, last year, or 2019 actually, 2019, I don't know, where, whatever it was, was accused of some um, sexual, in you know, assault charges from people. Um, then it was assumed or alleged that he was involved in some underage stuff, which kind of then later got dismissed. But he was kind of, you know, um, had some serious allegations on top of his head, which resulted in him basically getting cancelled. He got dropped by his agent, removed from a movie. Um, his Netflix show with Bill Graham Callan got um, terminated. Brian Callan ended up getting removed and cancelled too due to his own allegations and it seemed like for the most part the entire LA comedy scene which kind of seemed a little bit close from the outside in for the looking in it did seem like a close-knit group and it seemed like they all kind of appeared in each other's podcast they all helped each other's numbers get up they kind of created this whole little scene around them the comedy store blah 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 blah, blah and Chris D'Elia was one of the main proponents of that scene, one of the biggest stars there, right? Known as being kind of a person that kind of garnered a lot of attention, sold a lot of tickets, um, got a lot of views on YouTube, blah, blah, blah. And they all kind of used him in certain, you know, in loose term to kind of boost their platforms, what they're doing. And the moment he got in a bit of trouble, it seemed like nobody really stood up for him or kind of backed him. Again, I understand it's difficult to do so. These guys have families. You know, Bert's got two teenage daughters. He's got a wife. He lives in LA with a nice house and stuff like he's just about got involved in the industry he's got netflix special i get it but just the lack of kind of support and the lack, especially outwardly on public in in general kind of really rubbed me up the wrong way and then when bert went on vlad tv of all places you know because he's a bit of a attention whore and he wants as much press as he can in the things that he's doing he then kind of um, dismissively said he hadn't spoken to chris D'Elia. he doesn't really know he kind of insinuated he didn't really know him that well um and just essentially kind of threw him under the bus a little bit and it really kind of rubbed me up the wrong way and i'd imagine if you're chris D'Elia knowing how long you know they've known each other for a while i'm gonna say maybe close to 10 years again only from outside looking at that i can imagine um you'd you'd kind of be a bit annoyed by it and then um, he obviously said on vlad tv and you know i would imagine behind the scenes chris lee wasn't too happy and then he kind of explained himself here in a podcast sort of kind of apologizing sort of for what he said so let's hear what he has to say regarding it but again i wasn't necessarily a big fan of what he said but let's see what he said in terms of how he felt when he replied to the question of have you spoken to chris D'Elia? what do you think about the issue and he sort of kind of tried to run away from it and make it seem like they weren't that good friends to see what he has to say in his own words it's interesting that that i'll tell you bill very candidly and i'll, I'll tell you off air who it was but i said i i said something about a comic in an interview i just was caught off guard and i i didn't i wasn't ready to answer it and i didn't know he wasn't caught off guard let's 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 kind of be honest right what else are they going to ask him about especially going on vlad tv you know it's a bit of a trash 
you know, uh, piece of trash platform anyway. He's always trying to court controversy. The most likely subjects they're going to bring up is, you know, joke stealing, um, maybe the stuff he had to do with, you know, the altercations he had with Jay Moore back in the day, um, Kevin Hart, that you kind of rags on, um, Mickey Mantle, Gene, Sober October. There's not many subjects that Red TV is going to be that familiar with when it comes to Burt Kreischer. So one of them you would imagine would be cancel culture. And especially at the time that he was recording the the in, interview with Vlad, it was still fresh off the heels of the whole Brian Callen stuff. And again, Brian Callen and Chris Lee were big people in that scene at that time. So him to suggest it came out of the blue was a bit, you know, again, he's kind of trying to absolve himself of blame, I'd imagine. But let's continue. Where I should say... And uh, and I reached out to the comic and was like, hey, man, I, I'm sorry that I piled on to that. I was like, I didn't I wasn't prepared to answer a question about it. And it caught me off guard. And, and uh, man, when you're getting when everyone like I, I, we well, both you, you should have gone publicly apologized. Exactly. I don't know. I don't it's there's man, there's so much fucking. There, everything is so. I know, I get it right now. Where you just go like, I don't know anything, so I should. I There's nothing complicated about it. Again, it's just cowardice. That's the problem. I said prior to the whole like um, Daniel Silver issue. Again, it's not as serious, but that Daniel Silver incident with the car crash, you know, is a great representation of just how poisonous and horrible the LA comedy scene is in general, right? You have, again, the charges against Chris are not some, you know, he didn't get caught, you know, stealing a piece of steak from flopping Walgreens or whatever it may be, right? Those are serious allegations against him. But when you just kind of, you know, took a bit of a breath and did what, what's that Drake say whenever something scandal happens, it takes 48 hours in order to respond. He gives it 48 hours before he makes his, decides he's going to respond or whatever it may be um if you just took a breath and just kind of analyze all the accounts of people that were coming after him once you got away from once you kind of were able to kind of dismiss all the other allegations of him kind of dealing with underage girls what you kind of were left with was the worst crime that he was obviously um you know maybe guilty of was maybe cheating on his partner who he, who at the time was pregnant and also the story where or the allegation where he tried to hook up with um, he basically hit up a girl who was underage at the time. She said what her age was. He kind of left. And then when she turned of age, he then got back in the DMs again, right? That's the only thing you kind of get him at for. But on paper, he didn't do nothing illegal. He thought the girl was of age. She wasn't. Then when she was of age, he came back. Creepy. You no, know, would you? Would I want to bring him around my sisters? Probably not. But it's not enough for his friends to throw him under the bus, especially when you consider, most likely, especially when you listen to people like Joey Diaz, he's always said, Chris Lee was always known as a ladies' man. He'd always come through at a comedy store with two to three or four or a harem full of different ladies of, you know, varying different ages. And people wouldn't really ask any questions. They just thought, yeah, this is Chris's lifestyle. It is what it is. And no one really questioned it. No one had any really explanation. No one really was, you know, was perturbed by it or wanted to speak out. But they knew who he was. They knew he was a bit of a playboy. They knew that he probably went on the road in order to kind of, you know, get his, you know, piece wet. It is what it is. And at the time when they, when his actual friends who know him and know the strength of his character, again, you don't know everything that someone does. You could just imagine the support of just, again, this the, the most egregious part about it is what you understand, right? Um, what's his name? Uh, when Harvey Weinstein was getting um, accused of what he was getting accused of, and his crimes were very detailed, very long, uh, had a lot of history of being a complete creep to you know loads of different people in industry, um, abused um, you know uh, actresses from you know decades, decades on, had a trail full of victims that he left behind him. But when they asked that, um, who's the director? The legendary director, I forgot his name. Oh, it doesn't matter, right? But when he asked this legendary director about comment regarding it, the issues or the allegations against him, he kind of quasi stood up for Harvey Weinstein and basically said, look, he's done great by me. He's kind of greeted all my movies. He's given me a budget. Um, he's kind of approved the budget, sorry. Been a support person, a support system that I could kind of lean on. So the guy that I know would never do that, but I'm just going to kind of take time to take stock and kind of, I need time to reflect on what's going on. And I'll give my an answer later. But the initial response was, I'm going to stand by my friend, but I'm still going to take some time in order to kind of analyze these allegations because they're obviously very serious. And again, this is Harvey Weinstein. You could have easily just been like, you know, no one would have blamed him if he just would have dismissed his relationship and threw him under the bus completely. But he still stood by him. So if they, if someone could do that for Harvey, when even when Harvey Weinstein's allegations and and eventually he got obviously charged with all of those um, crimes and he's still in prison now at the moment, if someone could stand by him, 
why couldn't you stand by Chris with something that was, you know, demonstrably less of a uh, of a crime than what Harvey Weinstein could ever have done? Especially if you know the character of the person. That's what really rubbed me the wrong way. And it showed, it kind of showed um, the hypocrisy of that scene. It showed that, you know, again, they're only your friends when you're up. When you're down, they kind of all abandon you for the most part. Especially if you're a star, it's sort of dwindling in some way, shape or form. Um, it's a really kind of sad way that this kind of whole thing burnt out. But again, maybe it's for the better, right? It's for the best. You know, since then, Joe Rogan got a Spotify deal, moved to Texas. Um, you know, California essentially got, you know, crippled by Gavin Newsom. Their possibility to go on stage was basically um, scuppered with the virus. Um, it kind of basically led to other people kind of see searching for other methods to kind of get their voice out there. So that dependency on the kind of LA comedy scene ecosystem them sort of dwindled so it maybe is for the best in general right this whole kind of um incestuous clicky thing it was kind of shown up to be nothing more than just a good time um group and then when it comes down again when you need your help when you need when you need their help they're not really there for you so maybe it was a good thing in general but at the time it did run and rub me up the wrong way let's continue and let's end this quickly i should resign with i don't know anything that's, well, that's, a, that's the thing well that's my thing about all of this shit it's just like okay if if what you're saying is true that's yeah that's terrible but it's just like i wasn't there you weren't there how can you speak about this with such confidence it's the truth man you know what i mean because you know you you want to make but that's when i spoke about it much confidence something to the, of this level of importance you want to make sure you, you get it right because if you get it wrong either way the, the level of damage that you're going to do like if you are wrong and then somebody who didn't do anything you know, suffers it, and then you find out it's bullshit. Now you're fucking over everybody with real stories. Yeah. Right? Oh. And vice versa. If you let somebody go, you know, who actually did something, then that's kind of giving license to, to other abusers and shit. But it's just, so my thing is, I don't want to fuck that up. Yeah. So if I wasn't there and I have no information about it, I don't say anything. Exactly. And that, that was the thing that just I found so fucking astounding. Exactly. Especially from people that are in the public eye that understand how uh, him. the way they. Um, what is it like the Daily Mail? You know, they, they like doing that. They did that to me one time. Bill Burr says something racist and they go like this. They put the quotes so you can't oh. do them, but people just read that. They took a clip of my podcast and it was i was about ready to go to australia oh, yeah. and i was but that's basically the crux of it um but yeah again i i think there is a lot to be said i think even was it um good comment there naruto um said friendship is a ship that sails no friendship is a is a ship is a ship it falls when one hits an iceberg yeah for sure I agree with that john says but it's a comedian that just works hard and promotes himself but his material is the worst man agreed that podcast is annoying as fuck with but crash laughs at like people but also the podcast sometimes yeah for sure for sure so again man again maybe it's for the benefit maybe it's for the best in general going forward you know everyone kind of went their separate ways and the dependency for that little crew kind of dwindled but god almighty man where's the loyalty and friendship where is the loyalty and friendship